Welcome to the second webinar of the Think Wider webinar series of 2022, New Perspectives on Development. I'm Kunal Sen, the director of Trainee Wider. The Wider seminar series features a lineup of eminent researchers and development specialists who present their work and discuss new perspectives on the topic of global development. On the occasion of International Women's Day, we are pleased to host a webinar on women's work. The webinar will present the initial findings of the UNU wider project, Women's Work Roots to Social and Economic Empowerment. We know that the gender gaps in pay and labor force participation are real and persistent worldwide. worldwide. Women often, often occupy the worst paid jobs with the least protection, but gender-related social norms often hinder women's access to better opportunities. The project tried to understand how processes of economic development and social change affected women's labor market outcomes. What forces can bring about opportunities for women's work that truly enhance the economic empowerment? And what development agendas are most likely to improve gender equality and bring about the achievement of SDG 5? I'm pleased to welcome Ashwini Deshpande and Yaneke Peters, who will present today's webinar. Ashwini and Yaneke are the two project leads of WIDA's Women's Work Project. Let me introduce the two speakers in turn. Ashwini Deshpande is Professor of Economics at Ashoka University, India, and UNE WIDA Non-Resident Research Fellow. Her PhD and early publications have been on the international debt crisis of the 1980s. Subsequently, she has been working on the economics of discrimination and affirmative action with a focus on caste and gender in India. Among Ashwini's many publications are the books, Grammar of Caste, Economic Discrimination in Contemporary India, published by Oxford Press in 2011, and Affirmative Action in India, published by Oxford Press in 2013. She's a co-editor of Boundaries of Clan, Clan and Color, Transnational Corporate Comparisons and Intergroup Disparity, published by Routledge in 2003. Ashwini has also received the Exim Bank Award for Outstanding Dissertation in 1994 and the BKRB Rao Award for Indian Economists under 45 years of age in 2007. And let me introduce Yanaki Peters, who is Assistant Professor of Development Economics at Warwick Organigan University, Netherlands, Research Fellow at ISEA, and like Ashwini, also UNU Wider, Non Resident Senior Research Fellow. Her research interests are primarily the fields of labor economics and development economics, with a focus on labor markets and gender inequality. She has studied the determinants and consequences of female labor su uh, supply in developing countries, including the links between trade li uh, liberalization and women's labor market outcomes in Brazil, Indonesia, and India. Yannick is currently working with the World Bank on the measurement of labor and agriculture, and on the implications of the new ICLS definition of work employment in several African countries. Now onto a few logistical issues before I hand over to, uh, to Ashwini and Yannicke. Please type in your questions using the Q&A feature that you see on your screen. I'll read out the questions on your behalf. The webinar will be recorded and shared later on our YouTube channel afterwards. Yannicke will speak first and then Ashwini for around 30 minutes, which will leave around 25 minutes for Q&A. So now over to Yannicke. Yannicke, thanks so much. Do go ahead. Thank you very much, Kunal. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar. It's a great pleasure to speak today uh, on International Women's Day about the issue of women's work and economic development and social change. Um, let me see if I can move the slide. Yeah. Um, I'd like to first very briefly take a moment to remember Stefan Klaassen, who uh, passed away in October 2020. Um, Stefan contributed greatly to the study of gender inequality. Um, he was also uh, actively involved in the start of this UNU wider program on women's work. And you'll see um, that some of the, the last papers that he published before he passed away were on the issues that we're talking about today and inspired directly or indirectly uh, lots of the papers written uh, as part of this program. So I'm very much thinking about Stefan today and of course sad that he's no longer with us as he would have been a very active and inspiring uh, member of this uh, community to discuss and research these issues. 
Um, so to start, uh, as I mentioned, Stefan's uh, recent uh, work was on, on exactly this topic. And uh, some facts that emerge from uh, recent studies on women's labor force participation are, first of all, that on the supply side, we see across many countries that um, rising education levels and declining fertility have contributed to rising female labor force participation. And this is a, a joint experience across many low and middle income countries. But at the same time, we see that there's still huge variation in terms of trends in women's labor force participation, but also in terms of levels that are really largely unrelated to differences in educational attainment and fertility trends. And they're also largely unrelated to differences in other observed characteristics of women and their families. Um, and so these observed characteristics, by and large, uh, we use those to capture typically supply side factors that determine women's labor force participation. And so including education and fertility, but also um, family composition, uh, location, etc. cetera. Um, so these differences that are not so not so much explained by supply side or individual level observed characteristics, uh, for sure partly reflect differences across countries in the barriers that women face, which are, are related to social norms that Ashwini will talk more about. Uh, they're also related to various sources of discrimination. They're related to differences in historical economic structures and gender roles that are persistent, so that still impact outcomes today. But these differences will also reflect what is happening on the demand side of the labor market. Um, and we know much less about uh, the importance of demand side factors. Um, I think empirically it's just more challenging to study. Uh, but from, uh, for example, from recent studies analyzing trade liberalization reforms, uh, I think what's very clear is that the sectoral structure of the economy, as well as technological change, are very relevant factors. Um, so two studies I cite here, but there's more studies have explored the, the fact that many low middle income countries underwent massive liberalization of their trade policies in the 1990s. And, and in most cases, those reforms had very different impacts on men and women in the labor market because they affected the sectoral structure and technological change in the economy. Um, now, why, why are these so important? That's related to the sectoral and occupational segregation that we observe uh, across the world. In all countries, uh, this segregation is quite persistent. Um, so men and women tend to concentrate in different industries and different occupations. And even within occupations, we see strong gendered patterns in terms of the tasks that men and women perform. So two recent studies uh, conducted as part of this uh, UNU program uh, explore or they, they use this notion of segregation to, to try and, and get a better understanding of the role of labor demand and macroeconomic policies in shaping women's labor force participation and also their access to good jobs. Um, so I'm going to highlight some insights from these uh, two studies that are um, that happen to be uh, on Latin America both. Um, and I'll highlight a few interesting methodological or measurement issues that I wanted to share today, as well as, uh, of course, some key findings that have emerged. So Balotra and Fernandez study uh, the rising female labor force participation rate in Mexico since the 1960. Uh, this, uh, the graph here shows male and female uh, participation rates. The blue line is uh, the rate for women with the vertical axis on the right hand side um, associated with that. And so from the 60s to 2015, women's participation rate in Mexico increased from 13 to 47% with a very steep acceleration in the 1990s. Um, and so what what the authors do is they exploit, uh, they explore census data uh, to look at both supply side and demand side factors. And so the classic supply side factors considered are education, marital status and fertility and a few others, but these three and especially education account for a huge part of the rising female labor force participation. And together they explain almost three quarters of it. So over, this, over these, uh, these five or more decades. Um, now, of course, education, marriage patterns and fertility in turn might well be 
affected by what's going on at the demand side, but this is sort of a typical way to, to try and tease out what these factors have contributed. And um, then in the paper, they, they explore variation across municipalities in Mexico to understand a bit better what, what the demand side might have contributed. And, and they do this by looking at uh, sectoral shifts and occupational shifts. So the idea is that if you look at uh, total employment growth in Mexico, which sectors has this employment been concentrated in or which occupations has this been concentrated in? And what they conclude is that the occupational shifts in employment growth in Mexico have actually contributed to drawing women into the labor force. And uh, based on their estimates and some back of the envelope calculations, this for about 40% of the total increase in female labor force participation over this period. Now, what, what are these occupational shifts? So why are they conducive to women's labor force participation? mainly because the occupations that have expanded have, have been relatively uh, female intensive. So I'd like to show two figures that the authors present that nicely illustrate this. Uh, on the left here, you see for three female dominated occupations, the, the female share of workers within each of these occupations. So those are technicians, associate professionals, that's the black line in the middle, clerks, the blue line on top, and third uh, services and sales workers. So you see that um, in 1960, uh, between 20 and 27% of workers within these occupations was female and that share has increased a lot over time. But on the right hand side, you see that the share of these occupations in total Mexican employment has also changed. And very notable here is the, the increasing importance of services and sales workers. So, so in 1960, service and sales workers accounted for about 10% of total employment and that more than doubled uh, by 2015. Um, and so what the authors conclude is that sort of the, the change in the occupational structure of employment in Mexico can explain within Mexico across municipality variation in female labor force participation growth and overall seems to be able to account for a large part of the overall growth of female labor force participation in Mexico. Now, as I said, it's well possible that shifts in the occupational structure of employment, shifts in the sectoral structure of employment can also indirectly affect uh, women's education levels, right? The extent to which families invest in girls' education. Um, women's labor market opportunities have an effect on their marriage market decisions, on their decisions related to fertility. So it's also very well possible that these shifts in the structure of labor demand have contributed much more than, than this 40% to overall increases in female labor force participation. But I think this study is very, very nice example of how to how to explore that what, what's going on on the demand side. And so I encourage everyone to, to, to download and, and read that paper for more details on the methodology and for more interesting uh, figures. There's many in the paper. Now, um, another paper by Aurora Brownstein and Seguino focuses on multiple Latin American countries and asks, okay, we've seen rising participation of women in the labor force uh, in uh, Latin American countries. But we also see persistent segregation across occupations and sectors. Uh, so have women really gotten access to high quality jobs? And uh, can we also study what macroeconomic or policy factors uh, are correlated with women's access to high quality jobs? So to measure high quality jobs or what they call good jobs in the paper, um, they take uh, groups of industry by occupation. So we can call these jobs. So for example, sales workers in the textiles industry is one type of job. In total, they analyze 250 uh, jobs. And so within each job, uh, they assess the median weekly earnings of workers and they compare it to the overall national median weekly earners, right? So uh, do sales workers in, in the textiles manufacturing, uh, their median earnings, are they above or below the national average? If they're above, then this is, these are good jobs. They also do this by gender and, and by industry. So they're asking within a particular industry, Z, how many female workers are in jobs where women earn more than the national median? And I think this is a very nice way to use 
uh, data sources from different countries that might have different definitions um, uh, to get a consistent definition of, uh, you know, a high quality or a decent job, even if it's just based on earnings. But it's still, uh, I think it's still insightful. And so I've taken some of their data to construct the following picture, which illustrates very well that women have uh, much worse access to, to good jobs than men. So what you see here on top is, is the distribution of employment across industries. So in blue are, are, are male workers. You see that uh, almost 40% of male workers work in trade services, which includes host hotels, restaurants, retail trade, et cetera. Uh, and also 30% of women are in trade services. And then for women, community and domestic services are important, education and healthcare. Well, for men, uh, mining, construction and utilities come second. So that's on top. And then in the bottom panel, you see um, separately again for men and women, uh, the share of good jobs within each industry. So if we look at uh, trade services, which is a major employer for both men and women, you see that, that uh, about 50% of men in trade services work in good jobs. So jobs where men earn above the national median weekly income compared to only 14% of women. So only 14% of women in trade services are in jobs where women earn above the national median weekly income. And so this can reflect job segregation within the industry, obviously, but also men earning more than women in the same job. Um, and now what the authors do is they construct for 15 Latin American countries for, for many years uh, covering the period 1990 to 2017, if I'm right. Uh, and then they're, they analyze, so does this, the share of women in good jobs and the share of men in good jobs, how does it correlate with macroeconomic policies or, or macroeconomic uh, uh, variables like, like trade related variables? Um, and, and they do the same types of analysis on segregation. So just a few key findings then um, from their analysis. First of all, they find that uh, public social spending increases the share of women in good jobs, and it also reduces occupational segregation. So that's, I think that's, that's a very interesting message and something that begs for, for further analysis, like what type of social spending is it? Is it healthcare spending or other type of spending? But certainly very interesting result. Second, they find that minimum wages uh, increase the share of men in good jobs, but not women. And they, uh, so one potential explanation they offer is that women are more likely to work in the informal sector or to be in self-employment where the minimum wage um, has less of an impact. So it's not directly, doesn't directly apply to informal businesses. And so that's why it might affect men more than women. And finally, uh, they find that industrial productivity measured as real output per worker it is associated with uh, an increase in the share of good jobs for men, but a decline in the share of good jobs for women. Um, and they argue this is in line with some, some other research that shows that um, industrial upgrading actually pushes out women from industry. Um, and they also find that it's associated with increased industry and occupational segregation. So it seems that women may lose good jobs in manufacturing as industries upgrade, which is of course very worrying uh, finding. So then to wrap up a few thoughts about going forward, I think the importance of labor demand is clear. Um, we know the occupational sectoral structure matter a lot because of persistent segregation in the labor market. Um, we know that macroeconomic policies, which may be non-gendered in their design can have very gendered implications because of that, uh, as well as technological change. Um, but then it's much less clear how, how one could bring about changes in labor demand that support women's work and access to good jobs. Um, I think that's a very challenging and interesting research agenda where um, many questions might be hard to study in low income countries as they require a lot of data. And sometimes research is also limited by the fact that uh, data sets are often not directly comparable across countries or over longer time periods, which is really a challenge for this more sort of macro and globally focused research. But I think some areas, some fruitful areas for research are, you know, to look 
again and uh, more into to the impact of trade and investment policies. In that sense, it's, it's also great to see this recent initiative by the World Trade Organization of starting a gender research hub. Um, also, I think social spending is a very, very interesting uh, area for, for more research on how this affects supply as well as demand side factors um, that impact women. So another paper in this program by Vu and Gleva shows the impact of maternity leave extensions in Vietnam, um, which has you know, impacts on women's labor supply, but it can also affect demand because it makes hiring women more costly. Uh, and then and minimum wages uh, would also be a, a, a very important area to study more how, how these affect men and women differently, depending on the distribution of wages, depending on who's concentrated in the informal sector, etc. Um, and then finally, I have no doubt that targeting social norms and discrimination need to happen as well alongside any macroeconomic non gendered policy initiatives. So I'm very happy to uh, hand over to Ashwini to talk more about uh, the role of norms. Uh, thank you, Annika, for the excellent summary. And uh, thank you, uh, Kunal and your new wider for organizing this and for giving us a chance to, um, uh, to present uh, some summaries of the project that Yannicka and I have been leading at your new wider. Uh, but before I start, a ha very happy International Women's Day to everybody uh, listening. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, another set of issues that, that our project has had thrown up the papers that uh, you know, we commissioned. Um, now, in terms of social norms, particularly in developing countries, and especially for India, which has persistently seen a low labor force participation rate of women that has recently been declining, there's a great deal of focus on gender norms. And uh, the explanations for women's low labor force participation rates are often sought in non-economic or sort of sociological norm-related uh, issues. So, you know, what are gender norms, customs, taboos, practices that immure women? And uh, these have, as I said, you know, for developing countries, somehow uh, these acquire a greater significance in the discussion. South Asia, the region that I come from, is known as the belt of classic patriarchy. And um, almost every phenomenon that we observe in terms of male-female gaps in women's economic empowerment and um, labor force participation, participation in paid work, entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth, almost everything is uh, attributed to uh, patriarchal conservative social norms um, in, in, in India and in developing countries. Um, However, when you look at uh, in inegalitarian or patriarchal norms and support to such norms, which are ad adverse to women, uh, you see that almost ev in every country of the world, you know, whether you look at the reproductive rights issue that's going on in the United States, you look at, uh, you know, domestic or intimate partner violence in the, in the UK and so on and so forth. There are, there are examples galore because patriarchy is everywhere. And so the question then is, uh, you know, where do norms matter and where they don't and how do they matter? So one of the norms that, for example, in the context of India has been particularly talked about is violence against women. And it's, it's, there are papers that talk about how a decline in female labor force participation rate can be uh, attributed to increasing violence against women. Now, I have data from India as well, but this is just some global uh, uh, you know, calculations that I did with a student of mine. And when you see violence against women, which is again present in every single country, and if you look at the ratio of female to male labor force participation rates, you really don't find a negative relationship with FLFP globally, right? And so while uh, violence against women is an extremely important problem everywhere and needs to be tackled, its relationship with women's participation in paid work is less obvious, at least, uh, you know, to, to me. Um, one of the norms, for example, in, for which South Asia is particularly notorious is the very high degree of inequality between men and women in terms of domestic chores, you know, unpaid work that, that you do on a routine basis at home. And India and Pakistan sort of have the most unequal ratios. You know, in India, women do as much as 10, 10 times more, spend 10 times more hours on domestic chores compared to, uh, compared to, um, to men. 
uh, and again, South Asia has also been, you know, this picture has been changing, whereas India and Pakistan have sort of stuck to this unequal norm. In Bangladesh, over time, you see a much more equal division of unpaid, uh, of domestic chores. And it could be that an increase in female labor force participation rate has brought about this change in norms. You know, it's, it's, a, it's something worth thinking about. Uh, and I, I'm going to give, pre present some more evidence to, to, to support my, my hunch, right? And so when we talk about social norms, when we talk about patriarchal norms, given that they are present in pre pretty much every country, which ones matter? And how do they matter in terms of women's economic empowerment? And so I think that one of the things that our project has brought out and uh, something that I'm always fond of saying is we need to have more nuanced conversations about the role of social norms in explaining women's economic indicators. You know, to, to make this very black and white picture of developing countries have norms that lead to low labor force participation rates and developed countries have no patriarchal norms. Uh, that, that sort of black and white picture, to my mind, doesn't seem very convincing. And it's really good that in our project, we've actually find papers that have that, that bring out that part. Sorry to begin with my own paper, uh, but basically, uh, you know, uh, my paper with Naila Kabir, uh, uh, which you can access from the um, UNU wider website, is precisely on norms that matter. And the norms that matter that we've identified through a primary survey in India is the burden of reproductive labor domestic chores, care work, which is incessant, repetitive, monotonous, unrecognized, not respected. And it is definitely inimical to women's economic participation and economic empowerment, because even if paid work is available, they are unable to access this because of the burden of domestic chores. And we find that the conventional uh, culprit of you know, religion or whaling or all of these things, we don't find that to uh, be statistically significant when we look at the data. I have another paper which is not a part of this project, but I'll just make very a uh, quick reference to that, which is that we have um, uh, with my student Jitendra Singh, we've been looking at high frequency panel data for India, longitudinal data. And we find that over a short period of four years, the same women repeatedly enter and exit from the labor force. If it were just norms, you would not see this picture. Either women would be in the labor force or they would be out of it. But literally every four months, you see women changing their labor force status, which actually gives us reason. And you know, we, we've examined the demand versus supply side issues in that paper. And we find really that you know, what Yannicka was talking about earlier, which is it's the demand for women's labor, nature of occupational segregation, et cetera. All of these other factors matter, you know, determine these frequent entry and exit. Uh, one paper in, a, in the project by Sarah Khan on, um, on marital customs looks at female education and marriage in, in Pakistan. And she analyzes the role of financial shocks and marital customs. Um, and again, contrary to what you might expect a priori, she finds that when households suffer a wealth shock, a financial wealth shock, it does not have a gendered effect on school dropouts. And uh, adverse shocks, economic shocks during the uh, individuals' teenage years do not increase the probability of early marriage. Um, high, higher educated women receive more marital assets, which increase their bargaining power inside the household. And it also has positive intergenerational effects on their children's schooling. So again, many uh, myths about the way uh, you know, norms play a role in developing countries, you find those also getting a little bit you know, questioned or shattered. And I think that that's a very, it's very important to have these sort of nuanced, uh, uh, nuanced conversations. We have a paper on the motherhood penalty, uh, which is the evidence for which mainly comes from developed countries because you do have data which, where you can track mothers and non-mothers as well as mothers and fathers immediately before and after the birth of the first child. So it's very rare to find uh, exact estimates of motherhood penalty um, on, uh, from developing countries, but we have a paper in our project that looks at four South American countries, Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay. Um, and uh, what they find is that motherhood um, reduces women's labor supply uh, because women then are, uh, you know, have the additional burden of childcare and they also seek better work-life balance. So it increases the demand for more flexible occupations and it reduces women's, uh, uh, women's labor supply. 
and what um, and countries that have more conservative gender norms and less generous family policies uh, see greater differences between mothers and non-mothers labor market outcomes, right? Now this brings me to the question. You know, notice here the word generous family policies, which um, which brings me to the question of are norms static, or were they was there always a difference between these gendered norms between developed and developing countries? Well, the answer to that is no. You know, for example, here's a picture from our world in data that looks at weekly hours dedicated to home production in the United States between 1900 and 2005, right? And so you see over, uh, you know, over 100 years, you find that men's weekly hours in home production have increased. Women's weekly hours dedicated to home production have declined. But even in 2005, women do more uh, domestic work compared to uh, men in the United States. So, and, and the gap was pretty wide, uh, you know, in 1900. So what we think of as these very fixed norms, even historically, even the present day developed countries, you see that they've also evolved and norms have changed, right? And when we, you know, in the previous slide, we talked about a generous family policies. So I think going forward, the, the challenge that we need to grapple with is how do we change norms in developing countries such that they uh, enable women's economic uh, empowerment and women's participation in paid work? Now, I would like to make, you know, uh, draw a, a distinction which everybody knows about, but I'd like to draw our attention to the distinction between social norms and social institutions, right? And institutions is a wide term, it includes norms. So all the informal institutions like sanctions, taboos, customs, traditions, code of conduct, et cetera. These are what we call norms, but there are also formal social institutions, you know, property laws, inheritance laws, education, right to work, freedom of movement, right to vote, et cetera. You know, we are celebrating International Women's Day today, which, is, which marks the demand for women's right to vote, right? And so formal institutions can signal and establish norms of equality, even when the underlying informal norms might be more inegalitarian than what the formal institutions are signaling, right? Now, of course, there, there will be a conflict between a formal equality and substantive equality. It, it doesn't automatically follow that you change laws and you change the formal institutions and automatically there'll be a change on the ground. But that's really the way forward, right? Uh, when women got the right to vote 100 years ago, after that, many things changed in the present, present day developed countries and so on. So what I would argue for, and I think that's the lesson to take away also from our project, is that we need to figure out ways in which formal uh, social institutions that guarantee formal equality can be strengthened and which will also weaken the material basis of male dominance, which in South Asia takes the form of son preference, you know, very, very strong desire for a son. And uh, this uh, uh, together will eventually lead to changes, I think, in the, in the norms, uh, you know, a picture in, in developing countries. I know this is easier to put on a slide than to actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, make, make it take effect. But his, history tells us that it has happened. You know, norms have changed in, in countries, uh, maybe over 100 years, but they have changed. And so similarly, I feel like the push should be now to figure out what kinds of changes in formal institutions need to be brought about and economic structures need to be brought about to ensure uh, uh, women's equality. Uh, so I'll stop there and hand over back to Kunal. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Yannick and Ashwin. It was very clear and extremely, and also on time. So we have some time for Q&A. Sorry, a question I could see from Rajiv Goel. Um, can please everyone can send in the question to the chat function um, so I can then see who's asking and I can read that question out or ask you to uh, invite you to ask the question live. Then we can see if I can find Rajiv Goel and the participants. So I can ask Rajiv to actually ask, ask his question live. If not, I'll read his question out. Yes, sir. As you can see the question too, uh, Yannick Ashwini. Let me see if I can find Rajiv Goel on the the audience there, okay. Rajiv, uh, if you want to, you can ask a question live. I think you are muted. I was just uh, 
making the point that uh, norms, you know, this difference between male and female household work uh, over time for any country could be changing for a number of reasons. For instance, institutions change, and like you mentioned, you know, the government regulations, also so social customs. But I think all um, most importantly, it's the technology, you know, over time changing. Uh, for instance, uh, just to, you know, what, what comes to my mind is this microwave oven, you know. So now that has made some of the chores more accessible across gender, you know. Then I think uh, men would be more or have been more willing to do some chores because you know technology is there and uh, so i was uh, wondering uh, what your thoughts are on that so I, uh, my point was that uh, overall you know whether norms are changing by themselves or institutionally changing or technologically changing it might be very hard to capture over time for any country right thanks for Raji. it's a very nice question so i uh Yaniki and Ashwini, either of you can answer the question you want to. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's a there's always a multiplicity of reasons that lead to a change in norms, but technology doesn't automatically change norms. You know, in India is a very good example of that, which is, um, uh, you know, whether it's mic microwave ovens or LPG gas or whatever, it doesn't lead men into the kitchen to start doing domestic chores. We, you know, one wishes that it was the case, but that hasn't happened. So I think that my own analysis of the Indian scenario is that if women start going out to work, if women paid op opportunities for paid work are created for women, which they want to do, as survey after survey has demonstrated, if women go out of the house to work, that will change the norms of uh, sharing domestic work, not overnight, but over time. So I think the break break has to be in that vicious cycle. The break has to be let women go out first. I think that's what has happened in Bangladesh. The change that you see in the sharing of domestic chores, um, uh, you know. So that's that's my hunch. But yeah, so technology does play a role, but it doesn't automatically guarantee that uh, a change in sharing. Excellent, uh, Ashmi. Um, Yannick, did you want to also um, respond? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, maybe add that, I mean, it's it's obviously difficult to disentangle, but I also agree that some, some forms of technological progress may um, mitigate the impact of norms without changing the norms themselves, right? So we might see women spending less time on chores because there is technological improvement, but it doesn't change the, the, the perceived responsibility that, you know, that women have um, in taking care of, of domestic duties and, and children. Um, but yeah, and I, but I think, you know, uh, economists are, of course, or, or a large part of economists are very much focused on, on disentangling sort of what is caused by shifts in norms and then ultimately are those caused by technological change or were they caused by shifts in the structure of the economy or by changes in the law, et cetera. So I, I, I yeah, I think we're all very keen on, on understanding better what ultimately drives these changes. Thanks, Yannick. There's a question from anchor Sarah Philip on the dowry system, perhaps more addressed to Ashwini. Anchor, do you want to ask a question? Well, if you want to. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Ansi. Um, um, so I'm asking whether this female labor force participation uh, issues that we have in India, especially after this 2005, where we see a, a massive drop, uh, can be explained in terms of um, uh, structural employment policies, or is it the pervasive dowry system that has been there, that is there, even with legal interventions, we still have dowry system, which actually increases the opportunity cost of having the girl child, um, uh, you know, th that, that decision itself. So do you really think um, that we can talk, we can think about the female labor force participation rate in terms of the dowry system or the pervasive nature of it in India or South Asia? Yeah, so um, uh, one thing just to clarify, as Yannicke mentioned uh, in the beginning, we in today's talk, we focused really on papers that were a part of our project. And our comments were, uh, you know, set, focused around the papers. So of course, there are many things, many things that we didn't talk about, and dowry being one of them. But the paper on Pakistan does talk about both bright price and dowry. Um, 
in terms of the relationship between dowry in india and female labor force participation decline i i i doubt if you can make that direct connection because a low level of labor force participation is one issue and the other is a decline and uh, i i can't see a very obvious connection between dowry which has been pervasive and as you say uh, you know despite leg legally not being uh, uh, it, it being illegal, uh, you know, it still persists, uh, and so I, I don't, I, I don't immediately see a direct connection with female labor force participation. What I think it reflects is a very strong sun preference, and um, uh, things that follow from that. Anyway, that's a different conversation, but maybe um, we can have that maybe offline sometime. Um, I don't know if Yannicka, you want to add something to this. No, maybe we should turn to the. Next question. Remaining yeah. questions. So there's a question from Anuse Mirkusal. I hope you got the name right. Anuse, I, I think I can unmute you. So if you want to, you could ask a question yourself. Now it's an okay. interesting question. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So my name is Anuse, and I'm asking about. Um, so, um, Professor Deshpande, you mentioned that you know norms that matter need to be addressed. So I'm talking about formal institutions when you're bringing a change in them is care to be exercised in that domain as well because for example so i've read about how um, you know so amartya sen writes about the missing women in india and the entire phenomenon that happened with sex selective abortion despite it being you know legislated upon uh, in india and then you've got things like the adult uh, sorry the, the the marriageable age for women which is being raised in india as well uh, recently but we don't know what kind of unintended consequences that could have. I mean, child marriage is still a very big part of Indian society. And if women continue to be married that way, they might be um, excluded from uh, services such as um, you know, the ones that are given to uh, mothers and their children if, if they are found to be uh, child married. So how do we exercise that uh, you know, care in, in, in thinking about the trade-off in at least the short run? with these institutions? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, thank you for asking that question. And there's no um, doubt that we, um, we, we have to be very careful in terms of formulating uh, changes in formal institutions, especially in a country as diverse as India, with multiple uh, communities, multiple, uh, uh, at multiple levels of development. Now, as far as child marriage is concerned, I unfortunately don't uh, uh, agree with you, which is that I don't think child marriage is, is, an, is a huge problem in India. Age at marriage has been rising over time. And you know there, there's a lot of literature on age at marriage about how it's related to economic development. And you know, so the, India has seen that same trajectory as all other countries in the world have seen. You know? And so uh, I, uh, you know, there's been excellent commentaries on the recent change that the government is trying to bring about. And, Personally, I don't think that's what is the most pressing uh, element um, of um, uh, uh, that constrains women from working outside the home. In fact, if you criminalize marriage above 80, uh, you know, marriage below 21 for women, uh, that can have many other kinds of very disastrous consequences on families and communities. So, I, yeah, uh, it's not, I mean, that's not certainly not the biggest problem for women in India today. Because in any way, it's been rising over time. So fertility is low, age at marriage is rising. So what's, I don't see what the issue is here. I think female labor force participation, yes, that is an issue. That needs to be worked on. Right, uh, Shunya, I'm going to, uh, perhaps, Yannick, the next question might be more for you. So this is from Anna Jenderajian. Anna, if you wanted to ask a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, we discussed very much in my uh, in our work in FAO the issue of informality in rural development in agriculture, and we see these patterns. But I would like your opinion about um, how much the change of social norms comes from the formalization of agricultural employment, uh, and whether this is a, there has been any evidence, and especially with Aurora's paper. At all, uh, you were mentioning that there is a clear evidence that such uh, certain public policies encourage uh, access to good jobs. So, yeah, like that. thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. So, 
Um, so maybe first I should clarify that the uh, Aurora et al. paper on Latin American countries was all about non-agricultural employment. So, but, but one clear message is that industrial upgrading leads to sort of more good jobs for men, but not, but less actually good jobs for women. Um, and I think it's a very, very important question, like to what extent uh, upgrading or modernization of agricultural jobs and agricultural um, value chains in low income countries is going to affect uh, the quality of, of labor market outcomes or work outcomes for men and women. Um, and and I've, I don't think we, we, we know that much about it. Um, so if, so one, one comment I want to make is that it's not necessarily the case that formal employment is going to be of better quality than informal employment, right? So we, we see that, uh, you know, when new, like in, in Ethiopia, when new industrial job opportunities become available, it's, it's, not, it's not guaranteed that these are jobs with any type of security or opportunities for advancement or, or even decent work conditions. Um, um, so I think it's, uh, I do think it's promising to, to see that, you know, within, within Africa, if there is modernization of agricultural supply chains that would offer um, low-income families uh, job opportunities in, in more advanced uh, agricultural production facilities. Um, that's definitely an opportunity for, uh, well, increasing their standard of living, but also through exposing workers to new social networks, new experiences, it could potentially contribute to shifting norms. Um, but yeah, I think we should be careful not not to sort of equate the two because, you know, low income families, the women in those families might might be pushed into sort of factory work or, or more formal types of jobs just out of pure economic distress and um, have very little bargaining power. And so so there's always a concern that these workers are actually exploited and they don't have any opportunity to develop productive new networks and skills, etc. Um, but, but, I, but I think uh, it's a very important area to study more. And, and I also think that uh, sometimes agricultural employment and rural employment is a bit under researched in this literature, um, in part because maybe the data is, is, is of lower quality. I'm not sure, but um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very interested also to learn more about what FAO is doing in that uh, direction. Uh, thanks, uh, Yannick. Actually, it's also a question which I think we have to think about the next year also from Sarah Golden. Sarah, if you want to ask a question. Yes, good morning. Um, I was really struck, Yannicka, by the, the graph in your presentation that kind of don't didn't directly show wage gaps, but were a version of wage gaps by occupation and maybe occupation and industry, and this sorting across jobs with broad brought to mind Claudia Golden's work on this. And I was just curious, this is a literature question, um, the extent to which there's work in developing countries on her argument that you know, greedy jobs in combination with higher household responsibilities explain wage gaps and women sorting into lower paid jobs within occupations. Um, yes, so basically a general literature question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I'm um, I'm not sure I've seen papers focusing on developing countries. I know there's some some new research on sort of sorting into different occupations um, and how that how that relates to differences in pre in preferences for different types of work, but also differences in skills and uh, discrimination by employers. Um, but yeah, so I know in, in the US, the, the picture is very clear that it's about the flexibility of hours or that you have to work sort of uh, uh, more than, than 40 hour work weeks. Um, and that sort of increases man's chances of advancing in these occupations. Um, but no, no, I haven't, I haven't really seen any, any of that for developing countries. Can I, uh, can I come in here? Could yeah, I? sure, yeah. yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Sarah, uh, you know, I have a paper uh, in World Development we, where we looked at regular wage and salaried workers in India, which is a very small segment of the workforce. But um, and we, we plotted wage gaps across the entire wage distribution. 
And actually in India, like in China, you have not so much a glass ceiling, but a sticky floor. So wage gaps are much higher at the lower end of the distribution compared to the higher end. And we also have this classic U shape where uh, if, uh, of by, uh, you know labor force participation by education. So you have high uh, labor force participation rates for uh, women with very low education and women with very high education, but it's the middle that, uh, that goes down. And for richer women in India, basically you outsource the domestic chores, you know, uh, in middle class and upper middle class households, you hire people to do the domestic work for you. Uh, and so some of the constraints that you find in uh, the US, uh, are, you know, they, they work out slightly differently in countries, at least India, I don't know about all developing countries, but certainly India. Uh, thanks, Ashwini. And, uh, and there's a question from Garima Agarwal, which is for in-kind transfers. Uh, Garima, if you, uh, if you wanted to ask a question. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Garima. I'm a PhD student at the Delhi School of Economics. Um, I, I was wondering, this is sort of related to some of the interventions that I've studied. Um, where um, do, you, do you know of good examples where um, long-term changes in norms could be facilitated by interventions um, which have um, in-kind transfers? Um, so my concern is that, you know, if the transfer itself isn't leading to those change in norms, then is it really a sustainable um, policy solution? What happens when you withdraw um, the policy? Do you go back to um, original behaviors? And if so, do we know of, um, uh, of things that have worked, which could be sort of replicated? Thank you. Yanaka, you want to? Yeah, could you clarify, Garima, uh, what you have in mind with in-kind transfers? Um, so for instance, some of my work, I look at um, things like sanitary napkin distribution. Um, now, one would imagine that uh, these are the kind of transfers that would lead to um, changes, but those changes might be slow. Uh, changes in norms might be very slow. Um, that perhaps is still worthy of attention and one should keep doing those programs. But um, I was wondering if there's other examples out there where programs which um, I think you mentioned mitigating the effect of norms, even if not changing them. But do you know of other examples from, um, from the collective experience, which one would keep in mind here? So one one paper I'm I'm now that comes to my mind is um, uh, the paper by Erica Field and others uh, mm -hmm. when uh, related to offering women uh, their own bank account so that mm -hmm. uh, the wages from uh, in in their case uh, public work participation um, are transferred to their private bank account um, which sort of induce more women to actually supply labor. And then also shifted, if I remember correctly, shifted uh, uh, how people, f f how men and women feel about women uh, working in, in, in those programs. And so I'm, I'm not sure if that qualifies as an in-kind transfer, but it's, it's, it's sort of an intervention where you, you, you know, you provide a very specific, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a very specific intervention with offering a, a private bank account. And, and it just, I mean, in that paper, it really uncovers sort of how these Sort of intra-household processes are related to to labor supply decisions and that there's sort of causal effects in both directions that you can sort of try to break this cycle by for example giving women more power over their own earnings um so that's one paper that comes to my mind i don't know ashwini if you if you yeah have... so I, I don't know about in-kind transfers as much but you know for example if you look at the literature on the self-help groups in india you know, mm -hmm. rural uh, uh, groups that get formed and also certainly in Bangladesh, uh, you find huge uh, changes in uh, women's propensity for, uh, you know, collective, you know, collective uh, uh, participation in terms of intervening in village level problems, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in terms of participating in local decision making at the grassroots level, and all of that has come about as a result of just being a member of a self-help group. Uh, so it need not lead to a huge change in income, but it certainly leads to a change in which women see them themselves as citizens of their rural community. So, you know, it's a, it's a fairly consistent literature and there's huge amounts of evidence. So not an in-kind transfer, but yeah, collective action um, 
you know, does, does make a difference. Seems to be sustainable also, but, you know, we'll see. Right. Uh, we're almost a bit uh, close, but there's one question maybe. Well, I'll just read the question because I don't think it's time to unmute. Um, Shiv Kumar, can financial need be taken as a push factor to raise women's policy level force? And what are the role of women's social capital? And let me also add my question to this that, and this is Yannick and Ashwini, if you had to think of one policy uh, implication or one thing you want to see to policymakers on the occasion of International Women's Day about women's economic empowerment, what would it be? That's one for Ashwini and one for Yannick to close. So question about financial need and social capital, but also what are the big policy methods that you want us to take away from, from the, women, the, the women's work project for UNY? Thanks. So financial need, I mean, you know, in India, you do see much higher labor force participation rates by the poorest women. But that while they are participating in, you know, basically trying to earn some money, that's what it is. So it is labor force participation, but you know, as Yanake mentioned, we also have to focus on the quality of employment. And so they would not, the kind of work that the poorest women in India do would not count as good jobs or decent work by any stretch of the imagination. So I think when we are talking about women's economic empowerment, you do have to, yes, financial need is definitely a push factor for everyone, including for women, but that should not be the reason to think of uh, women, uh, you know, that women should get jobs because just because their families need the money. In India, as it turns out, even the richer women, I mean, it's only the middle income women that, that have lower labor force participation rates. So in India, it's a little more complicated because you do see that, uh, that U shaped. Um, one policy implication, one policy prescription, I guess, create, create uh, jobs or have very clearly a gender lens when hiring and recruiting people for any kind of position uh, and you know whether it's the government or whether it's the whether it's the private sector uh, always pay attention to the gender composition of employees at all stages at all at all occupational levels yeah um, maybe I would add that always pay attention to the gendered impact of your non-gendered policies right and um, and so okay. And, and so one part of that is that we know there's this widespread and very persistent segregation of men and women in the economy. So of course, uh, I think it's unrealistic to say, you know, governments should design their trade policy to stimulate job growth in female intensive sectors and occupations and not in million. That would not be, but, but you know, pay, be aware that there are these gendered implications. And then if if you feel that you know we expect that this is going to generate labor demand mostly in traditionally male dominated areas of the economy then also think about policies to attract more women to those jobs and and there is clearly a role for employers uh, discrimination on the employer side how they advertise jobs how they try to attract new workers and i think we know quite a lot about what at the micro level what firms can do to attract a more diverse set of workers mm. Thanks so much, Yannick and Ashwini. I think we've kind of come to the close of this webinar. Uh, as Ashwini and Yannick mentioned, the UNI Wider Women's Work Project, all the papers, working papers on the web, on the project web uh, page on our website, the UNI Wider website. So do look for those papers, they're really fascinating papers. And of course, Yannick and Ashwini did their best to summarize the, some of the key insights in the papers. But of course, unless you read the papers, you will not understand how rich the papers are and how interesting they are and how much they cover the global south because we have papers in Latin America and on Sub-Saharan Africa and also on Asia. So do take a look at those papers um, on our website, on our webpage for, the, uh, for this project on the on the UNIWIDE website. And also hopefully we will also have a journal special issue coming out at some point. And of course that will also help us to more, you know, help you to see exactly any also further research being done on, on this topic, uh, on this very important topic. So really, thanks so much, Ashwini and, and uh, Yannicke, so much for the uh, for this presentation and uh, this uh, very nice discussion of the, some of the very nice questions we got from the audience today. And and uh, hopefully we will see you all in the next webinar. Uh, what the UNI Wider Web uh, webinar the second the next one takes place on twenty fourth of May, the third webinar for this year, twenty fourth of May. Again, full details are on our uh, website, and uh, look forward to seeing you there too. Thanks. Take care, all.
Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.